All right, I want to wrap up this unit with a discussion of a very important uh, property of propagation, which is propagation in free space. Free space meaning propagation without any obstacles. We'll deal with propagation in more complex environments in the next unit, but this is a good place to start. So to understand free space propagation, the first thing we need to do is define what we call the antenna effective aperture. So for that, imagine we have some receive antenna and there is some incident plane wave that is striking this antenna. And just for the moment, to make things simple, suppose that the polarization of that plane wave is aligned with the polarization of the antenna. We'll uh, address the polarization loss momentarily. All right, when you have this, we can define what's called the effective antenna aperture, which is the ratio of the power delivered to the load on that antenna by the incident power. So it's the um, kind of how much power gets transferred from that electromagnetic wave on to the load. Now, one of the important aspects of this is that this antenna aperture is actually a function in general of the angle of arrival of that incident plane wave. So that's why you see this theta and this phi um, being shown here. Now, there is a very important relation between the aperture or effective aperture of the antenna and its directivity um, we defined as we defined in the previous um, section. So let's first remember that the effective aperture is the ratio of the delivered power to the incident uh, power flux density of the uh, electromagnetic wave. And you can show this very important relationship that whatever the geometry of the antenna is, as long as it's lossless, its effective aperture will always be the directivity times some constant, which only depends on the wavelength or equivalently the frequency. And I'm going to give you a very good proof of that in the next couple of slides. But let me just um, state some key points about this simple antenna aperture directivity relationship. First of all, one thing about this is that the average aperture is always going to be lambda squared over 4 pi. Now, the reason why that's the case is because if you take the average, meaning you average over the angular directions, you will get the average of the directivity times this uh, lambda squared over 4 pi. But remember that the average directivity of any antenna is 1. So that means that no matter how big your antenna is, its average aperture will always just be lambda squared over 4 pi. You can build a giant parabolic dish antenna the aperture, the effective aperture on average is still this value. What a large dish antenna can do, as we'll see, is that it can have very high directivity in some narrow beam, but it has to pay the price and have very low gain in all the other directions so that the aperture, the average aperture is this value. All right, to prove this aperture directivity relationship, we need to um, introduce a concept that's also very important, called the reciproci reciprocity of antennas. So you might have heard this, and what this basically in loosely stated is this. So that if I have two antennas, say antenna one and antenna two, and in one case one transmits and the other receives, and then I switch the, one, the other transmitting and the other receiving, the channel in both directions are the same. That's loosely uh, what it says. And more precisely, you can define it like this. Suppose that I um, put some input current onto one antenna, and then I measure, say, the open circuit voltage at the terminals of the second antenna. And then, so one is transmitted, the others receive. And then I flip it. So I take now an input current I2 onto transmit antenna two, and then I measure the um, received uh, voltage on the terminal, the open circuit voltage on the terminals of antenna one. What reciprocity, reciprocity tells you is that the ratio of these, the, the output voltage to the input current is equal in both directions. Now, I'm not going to show you this, but it arrives fundamentally because that of Maxwell's equations can be kind of reversed in time, and that's why you get this uh, reciprocity. Now, 
what that all one consequence of reciprocity, reciprocity that we'll use to uh, prove this antenna directivity relationship is that the power transfer or the power transfer ratio in both directions are the same. So if I have one antenna transmits and I get some received power on antenna two and I flip it, that ratio of the received to transmit power will be the same. So with that in mind, we can easily prove the antenna aperture directivity relation. So here's our uh, two antennas. And suppose that antenna one transmits some power, let's call it PT. Now we know that the radiation density, well the total rate average radiation density at a distance r, which is a separation between these antennas, will be the transmit power divided by the area of the sphere, which is 4 pi r squared, and it'll be multiplied by the directivity of that antenna in that uh, direction. Now, the received power at antenna 2 will be its effective aperture times the power flux density, because that's just the definition of the effective aperture. So when I plug this in, uh, this equation in, I can get the ratio of the received to transmit power. But I could do this in reverse, and by reciproci reciprocity, these ratios must be the same. But then if I compare these two and set them equal, I know that for any two antennas, the ratio of the directivity to its aperture must be constant. But since this applies to any two antennas, I could take an antenna where I can easily compute this directivity and aperture. For example, if you take a short dipole, one of the first um, calculations you will make in a ENM class is its directivity, its peak directivity, and its aperture. And its peak directivity is 3 over 2, and its aperture is 3 lambda squared over 8 pi. I'm not going to derive them, but you can look them up, uh, for example, in Balanus's book. And we just set that on one side of this equation, and we get that the d to a ratio is indeed 4 pi over lambda squared, and that proves our aperture directivity relationship. Now, a very important consequence of the aperture directivity relationship is Friis's law. All right, to uh, explain this, suppose we have two lossless antennas in free space. We know from the previous side that the ratio of the received to transmit power is given by this expression here. And we know also from the aperture directivity relationship that the aperture on the uh, transmit side will be this directivity times lambda squared over 4 pi. So when you put these in, we get Friis's law for lossless, um, between lossless antennas, which tells you that for any two antennas, the ratio of the received to transmit power is given by this very simple expression. So some important points about this. First is that the the ratio of the received to transmit power, or the uh, power gain, will be inversely proportional to R squared, or equivalently the path loss will be proportional to R squared. Now that makes sense just geometrically as you get further and further out from the antenna, that same radiated power is being dispersed or spread over a sphere that's growing as R squared. So that's why this power is decaying by R squared. What's also interesting is that the path loss is inversely proportional to lambda squared or equivalently proportional to the frequency, which means that if you go to higher and higher frequencies, that path loss will go up. However, they can be compensated by this directivity and we'll see that the directivity can be increased as we increase the frequency, but we'll address that later. Just to illustrate this, if we take the path loss between two isotropic antennas, where, so the directivity is 1, or equivalently what you would call the omnidirectional path loss, so this graph plots the omnidirectional or free space path loss as a function of the distance, and you can see it grows up, grows <coughs> exponentially, and it also grows as we increase in frequency. All right, let's just uh, do a very simple calculation. Suppose you had um, an antenna 
at 2.3 gigahertz and you put the transmit and receiver about 500 meters away and then I want to compute the omnidirectional path loss meaning the path loss uh, before we include any antenna gate so that's super easy with uh, Friese's law we just uh, if I wanted to do it in MATLAB I would just uh, put in the constants to get the frequency and the um, <coughs> the uh, wavelength I also put in the separation distance and then I can just compute it uh, as follows note this 20 um, sign here because Friese's law is proportional when I'm computing the path loss in db I want to uh, uh, the squared becomes a 20 and also there's a negative sign here because I'm looking at the path loss not the path gain actually MATLAB has a built-in function for this FSPL so you can also just put that in of course you'll get the same number either way so use whichever one uh, works for you. All right, so recall that Friese's law assumed that the incident wave is aligned in polarization at both the transmitter and receiver. But in general, we need to consider the loss that occurs when, they're, when they are misaligned. So recall that the polarization for a plane wave is the direction of that E field um, relative to the direction of um, motion and in general this would be for a given frequency this would be a complex factor in three dimensions that I've shown uh, here now the polarization loss factor is simply the cosine squared of the angle of the between the incident um, plane wave and the alignment of the uh, receive antenna. So if you've drawn it, if I've drawn it like this, here is the um, uh, polarization of the incident plane wave, and here is the uh, uh, alignment of the receive antenna. In general, they would have some angle between them, and that would be the uh, um, cosine of that squared would be the loss. So just to make that clear, let's do a simple problem. Suppose we have a base station and it's say 10 meters high so so maybe five uh, four or five stories up um kind of like a microcellular deployment and you are 50 meters away and you're holding a handset and your handset's about one and a half meters from the ground and let's say that the base station in, is vertically uh, polarized transmits vertically polarized and your um, mobile is also vertically polarized and we want to compute the polarization loss well this is basically simple geometry what we do is we look at first at the direction of motion from the direction of the plane wave and in the far field that will uh, just basically look like a straight line uh, from the uh, base station and that received wave will be perpendicular to this line and as I was saying the green line here is I'm assuming that the uh, UE the handset would be vertically aligned so just by geometry I just have to compute the cosine of the angle between them, and that's just high school geometry. And we can get that from this. Uh, it's going to be just this distance, this horizontal distance, divided by that hypotenuse. And that, in ca this case, is 0.985. That is a number very close to 1, and indeed, the polarization is very small. You only lose about uh, more than 0.1 dB. So that's great. Uh, you don't barely lose anything. But just to show you that polarization can be important, Let's say I turn the UE in landscape mode. All right, so maybe you're watching a video or something. Now let's look at where this UE antenna is pointed. So it's pointed here, and these are almost orthogonal to one another. In particular, if you calculate the cosine of the angle, it's about 0.168. And when you compute that polarization loss, now it's down to about minus 15.5 dB. So we lost a lot of power. Now, one of the uh, conclusions of this, you might think, well, how does my cell phone work at all if I can just turn it and I still I, I lose 15 dB? And the reality is this has to be something that you design very carefully when you're doing cell phones. Um, you want to be able to have the device receive in multiple polarizations. And if we get a chance later on, I'll talk a little about techniques to do this, things like cross-pole antennas or multiple arrays and so on. All right. A uh, couple more uh, technical points that we have to deal with. Um, one thing you'll hear um, related to antennas is called its impedance. And the reality is that actually when you have a, not all power from the radio is in general going to be delivered 
to the antenna. And one way to think about that is from if you've taken a transmission lines class is to understand this as one forward directed wave um, going into the antenna port and a reflected wave coming back out. And that some of that reflected energy is some of that energy that you want to deliver and radiate actually gets reflected back to the input uh, port. And the ratio of the um, uh, of the scattered the the input the incident wave and the scattered wave is related to something called the um, reflection coefficient, which is also if you take s parameters, which is also labeled as s one um, one. Now the um, that turns out this reflection coefficient to be related to something called the impedance mismatch. In particular, if you look at the um, input impedance and the impedance of the antenna and you compute this ratio you will actually that will in fact give you this complex reflection coefficient and in particular that reflection coefficient will be zero if the antennas are perfect and the uh, the um, input impedance and the antennas are perfectly matched but when they become um, mismatched then this reflection coefficient can actually begin to grow. And this is what is needed why you want to have a, a, a good impedance matching. Now, in this case, the fraction of that reflected power then will be just given by one minus this uh, reflection coefficient. So just as a um, picture of this, for example, here um, on the right, I've shown a picture of a 28 gigahertz antenna so that's a common 5g uh, frequency from this uh, publication here and it shows that uh, s11 ratio and in, in db so at the center frequency that s11 ratio is very small so very little reflected power so almost all the power is being delivered to the antenna but as we deviate away from this the antenna begins to reflect back that power so typically when one thinks about the bandwidth of an antenna it's usually about the point where the S11 is about 10 dB below, meaning, meaning that 90% of the power gets delivered. Another equivalent way to think about the um, S11 or the reflection coefficient is often uh, described as the voltage standing wave ratio. And that has that uh, term just because if you think about it in terms of the, um, you have a incident wave and a scattered uh, wave coming back. So there'll be two sinusoids and this is looking at sort of the peak to the minimum of that, uh, of that, of those two sinusoids. All right. Uh, when you put all those together, all these losses, you get a sort of a modified version of Friese's law. So the uh, terms here is Friese's law, but we have a loss from the loss in polarization. We then also have the losses associated with the uh, impedance mismatch at both the transmitter and receiver, as well as inefficiencies in the amplifier, which could be the conductive or dielectric losses that we mentioned in the previous section. All right, um, check out a demo. I've tried to put some MATLAB code um, on the GitHub site. Remember, links for all the uh, demos are below uh, this YouTube video. So in this uh, case, what I did here, very simple. I put a transmitter at this red dot and then to move the receiver along some path. And in this case, I measured, I looked at both the omnidirectional path loss. So there's a um, a low point here where it's kind of closest at the middle, but I also just did some very simple uh, geometry to show you how to compute the angle and then also use that with given a certain antenna pattern to compute the uh, gain. So just walk yourself through that demo and that will give you a good idea of how to do some basic geometry and path loss calculations um, for some simple antennas. All right, uh, once you get through that, I think you should try the in-class exercise. Again, that's in the GitHub site. So in this case here, you're just going to construct a, um, you're actually going to build on the patch antenna that you created in the previous uh, section, and you're just going to measure that far field radiation pattern and also try to align that antenna to get to a particular uh, target. So give that a shot. And that wraps up this unit. And actually, after you're done this, you can go ahead and try the problems and the labs.